everyone. I'm James Milan. Welcome to this episode of Talk of the Town, um, one I have been looking forward to having an excuse to do for quite a while, and now I have one. Um, I am talking today with Eric Stange. Eric is a local filmmaker who has been plying his trade here in Arlington for many years. We'll find out, perhaps, just how many years. Um, but his one of his most recent films, because you never can tell with the way in terms of when films come out versus when they're made, I know. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Pony Boys, which we will talk about to a much greater degree later in this uh, conversation, uh, has just shown at the Arlington International Film Festival, which just wrapped up yesterday, um, and will soon be shown at the International Children's Festival, I think. Is that right? Yep, Boston International Kids Film Festival. Kids, kids <laughs> that's right. I, I like the fact that you actually use kids there. Mm -hmm. um, so Boston International Kids mm -hmm. Film Festival, at the, and there's another showing of Pony Boys coming up there. And so that, again, has given me a great reason to invite Eric into the studio and sit down for uh, a talk just to, for me to figure out and for you uh, to figure out a little bit more about what does it mean to actually be a filmmaker as your profession, especially when you're based here in Arlington, mm -hmm. not in New York, not in uh, Hollywood, not in, you know, uh, Bollywood or anything like that <laughs> um, that we're all used to. Um, so again, with that lengthy introduction, as usual, I want to really thank you for being here. Well, thanks, James. It's great to be here, and I love talking about this kind of stuff, so I'm looking forward to it. Good. I'm very glad that you do, because I'm going to make you do so. <laughs> um, and again, as I said, I do want to just know, like, what is, what, is, what is life as a filmmaker like from the inside? So start by just telling us, you know, how long have you been in Arlington? Is this where you've been the whole time that you've been filmmaking? Um, and then... Just start to tell us a little bit about the decisions that brought you to that point, and then how do you do it? Well, my wife and I moved to Arlington about 33 years ago, I guess, and I had already started my career as a filmmaker at the time, but, but just barely. I actually started as a print journalist, mm. working for the Boston Herald and freelancing for the Globe and other uh, journals and papers and magazines. And at a certain point, I started writing about documentary filmmakers. And I got to know a few of the local people in Boston, which this was back in the early mid-80s. There was a pretty big community, there still is, of filmmakers in Boston. And I realized they were all having more fun than I was. I really just, <laughs> the more I got to know them, I thought, what a nice tribe of people. I mean, mm -hmm. they're really um, committed, and, and they work very collaboratively, and doing all these interesting stories. So. I decided to somehow get my foot in the door of documentary filmmaking, and I did it by going to a community media organization, a lot like this one, happened to be in Newton. Is that right? Yeah, but that's where I started. And they, they didn't give me any money, but they gave me gear. They gave me a camera and someone who knew how to run the camera. And that's what we I, do, right? Yeah, and I had a story I wanted to do, and they helped me figure it out. And, that's how it all started. So you hadn't, at that point, in, in, you know, you, as you said, you'd been a print journalist up to that point. Did you have any experience with filmmaking as a medium? No, not really. I mean, I'd written a lot of film reviews. I'd been a mm -hmm. movie reviewer for the tab and did stuff like that. Um, but no, I'd never had my hands on a camera. I mm -hmm. didn't take any film classes in college or anything. Well, I, I love the fact that, you know, part of this story is that local community media, Newton, Arlington, you name it, uh, c you know, gave you that initial leg up. Um, and look look yeah. what you've made of yourself. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's been only 35 years, but... <laughs> yeah, no, that's yeah, great. Yeah, but it, it was a great opportunity. And um, that, that's, you know, you gotta start. I always tell young people who want to become filmmakers, you can go to school, you can get a job as a production assistant, this or that, but you can also just get your hands on a camera and make a little film. It doesn't have to be an hour. It could be 10, 15 minutes, mm -hmm. and it'll still get into festivals if it's good. you got to make it good. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the best thing is just make the film. Yeah, because a lot of times way. you're spending, if you're spending time as a PA or you're, you know, you're in school or something like that, uh, you know, you are learning an awful lot of stuff that isn't going to necessarily go right to yeah. 
what you need to do in order to make a film. Yeah, I mean, ideally you do both because mm -hmm. it's great to learn from more experienced people. I mean, mm -hmm. I did that too. I was an associate producer for a, an English producer, documentary producer. I just kind of lucked into it. But that made a huge difference. I mm -hmm. learned a lot in a very short time. So I'm not saying you can learn everything doing your own film, but you kind of have to do both, I think. So um, let's talk about your films f first. Um, you've got, you, you've been at it for, as you said, more than three decades. You've amassed a body of work for sure, and one to be proud of. Um, you initially decided to be a documentary filmmaker, and that's what you have done ever since. Is that right? Yes. Were you ever tempted to get into feature filmmaking of any sort, or more something more creative? Well, a couple, I, I think three of the documentaries I've done had fairly substantial dramatic elements mm -hmm, to them. Mm -hmm. I call them dramatized documentaries, mm -hmm. not docudrama. <laughs> I don't like that term. Uh, and so I have had a taste of that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the most recent one I did that with is called Edgar Allan Poe, Buried Alive. It was on PBS a few years ago. They still show it around Halloween, usually. Not sure if they did this year. Mm -hmm. um, and that had a substantial amount of drama in it. It's it's hard. I mean, to, to go from that to a real mm -hmm. career in feature filmmaking is, is a big leap, and it's tough to do in Boston. But let me ask you, what was it like in those three films that you did kind of incorporate these kinds of elements? That meant that you were working with actors, right? And, uh, you know, that's fundamentally different from the kind of filmmaking that you're generally doing, I assume. Obviously, you're working with interview subjects and subjects of the films and things mm -hmm. like that. But, you know, what's it, different about... It's very different. I mean, it, part of it is just technical. You can't... Um, just turn on the camera and film an actor doing something. You've got to have told the actor exactly what you want him or her to do. And the camera operator has to know exactly what that person's going to do. And the lighting setups have to be just right. I mean, the last people forgive crummy lighting or bad sound or you know, things that happen in mm -hmm. a documentary. It's all part of the process. Uh, dramatic feature films even if they're part of a documentary, people expect a certain level of production value that's, that's tough and mm -hmm. takes a lot more people. Makeup, costume, all these departments I had no idea about <laughs> when I started doing it. You know, people would start saying, well, who's doing the makeup? Who's doing the hair? Who's doing the props? Who's, um, I'm like, I don't know. But I learned quickly. There's sort of a family joke the um, day before I was going to do it for the very first time on a film called Murder at Harvard about an 1849 murder at Harvard. Was that the Parkman? Yeah, the Parkman Webster yeah. case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did a film about that, and uh, we dramatized the courtroom scenes. We dramatized the murder. We actually dramatized quite a bit of it. And the night before the first shoot, I was in bed reading a book called How to Direct Actors. <laughs> my wife said, are you sure you're ready for this? But it went okay. I had a lot of help. Well, again, it's a little bit like what you were saying earlier about filmmaking in general. I mean, there is the reading of the books. There is the, you know, all the preparation. But then you just got to get you in there and do it, right? Do it. And yeah, yeah. And I was working with a really good director of photography named Boyd Estes, who's been around Boston doing this kind of thing for many decades, many more than I. And he knew, he, he was just such a huge help. Right, I able mean, to help you a, a, yeah, a lot. Yeah, in I everything, in direction mm -hmm. and blocking and all the things that I had no idea mm -hmm. how to do. Yeah, I do think that people should kind of, you know, stay mindful mm -hmm. of the fact that there are these dramatized uh, aspects or elements of a lot of documentary films that we see these days. Mm -hmm. And that that you know, as they're watching, there's if it's done well, it's fairly seamless, et cetera, not calling attention to itself. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a very, like you said, just a just a whole different kind of involvement uh, in there. Yeah. Um, so let me ask. Uh, I, I was talking about your body of work. Your drive was to be a documentary filmmaker. That's what you have been. Do you have? Are there other unifying elements to your body of work that you, you know? In other words, do you want to? Do you like to focus on certain kinds of stories? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, are you very kind of historically inclined, for instance, because you've mentioned Edgar Allan Poe, Francis Parkman, uh, et cetera? Um, so just just tell us what are the what are the, the the things around which the themes around which your 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 oeuvre. 
Yeah, I'd say history is the the common thread for most of my films. Mm -hmm. um, American history, for the most part, because it's much easier to get funding in the U.S. for films about American history. Uh, I was a history major in college, and and I loved those documentaries and that I would see on PBS usually mm -hmm. that covered some aspect of history. So that's what drew me into it. Um, and that's what ended up leading to the drama part, because if you're trying to do a film about an historical subject that happened before the advent of photography, you've basically not got a whole lot to work with. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can have interviews, of course, with experts and people, but um, you, know, you might have a handful of prints or paintings or etchings or something. Mm -hmm. Something and, very static. Though. Yeah, very static and very hard to fill an hour with. Mm -hmm. So that's what led us to dramatize the uh, the murder at Harvard film. Uh, that murder happened in 1849. Um, daguerreotypes had just started, but barely. So we did have portraits of a lot of the people involved, but that was it. Mm -hmm. And so we had to fill in a lot of gaps. And then that led to other um, dramatized parts of history, mm -hmm. which is always tricky because you're trying to be as accurate as possible, relying on the documentary record, so you don't want to take liberties that aren't somehow right. supported by the evidence. But nonetheless, you have actual people, or actual faces and expressions and things like that, well, and, and inflections and di in and the dialogue, dialogue. and yeah. uh, all that. It's very, you know, very difficult not to convey some kind of impression that you either mean to or don't mean to. Yeah, exactly. Uh, no, once yeah. you start dramatizing, I'm yeah. sure. Yeah, you that's be a very, very careful. It's an interesting challenge. Yeah, but I, I still am interested in historical documentaries. I've branched out a little and done a few more contemporary things. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I still get drawn back to history for the most part. Mm -hmm. Understandably so. I'm a history teacher myself. I love, love, love this very same thing. Um, American history in particular, very, very rich, very full. Yeah. Uh, could yeah. be doing this for several lifetimes, right? And <laughs> um, So one of the things, uh, one of the other distinctions, though, between feature filmmaking and documentary filmmaking, I would imagine, is that on the whole, in feature filmmaking, people are looking for things to be of a particular length. Um, and of course, there are, there are short, creative works. But documentary, it seems like there's a, a lot more flexibility about the whole process, perhaps, and certainly what the end result, how, whether that end result's going to be 30 minutes, mm -hmm. 57, whatever it is. There is often, but uh, most of my career I was doing things for PBS, mm -hmm. and there there's not a whole lot of mm -hmm. flexibility. Mm -hmm. It's either 60 minutes or 90 minutes. They always prefer 60. It's easier to program, which is really 52 minutes by mm -hmm. the time they do all mm -hmm. their stuff, you know, fundraising around the edges. Uh, so in a way, it, it's it's hard. You've got to hit it right on the nose. I mean, they tell you 53 minutes, 42 seconds, 12 frames kind of mm -hmm. thing. You get the, the letter. And um, Wow, interesting. Yeah, so, you know, there's not a whole lot of flexibility if you're doing it for broadcast, if for, a, for a series or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're doing an independent film that might end up eventually on PBS, that can be more more flexible, but they don't they don't like things that don't fit into their scheduling blocks. I don't know if you've you know I would imagine you're aware of how many films you have made um, over time, but um, whatever that number is, and ha you know happy to hear it if you want to share it. Um, how do those? Uh, what is the proportion there between the independent films that you're talking about that might? find their way to television at some point, um, but that is, you know, aren't being made under those constraints versus when you're either contracted by or in some other way working uh, for a PBS series, for instance. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I think I've made about 20 films. I would say every single one except the two most recent were done for broadcast oh, wow. of some kind or other. Now, sometimes they're commissioned. Um, that's the best. <laughs> they, could, they just give you the money and let you go. Um, often I've had to go out and raise the money and then go to PBS with, with some money in hand and mm -hmm. say, can you make up the rest? And they often do. Uh, on a couple of occasions, people have come to me with money, not the broadcaster, but mm -hmm. somebody else. 
and it hired me to make a film. I've done that two or three times, so uh, that that's the best. But yeah, I've never done, I'm trying to, to make sure of this, I don't think I've ever done one until these two shorts that I've done in the last few years that weren't specifically for broadcast. And what cha what's changed in the last few years that has, you know, allow either allowed you to do something that you mm -hmm. always wanted to do or, you know, meant that this is what you're, you're doing right now? Well, I, um, yeah, I'm at a certain age, re almost 70 figure. I can afford to not take all that time to go out and raise money again, although I'm probably still going to do it. Mm -hmm. um, it's gotten harder to raise the money. So in, in a way, I'm kind of glad that at this point in my life, I can afford to step back and just do things I want to do. Mm -hmm. um, but I've also, um, it's funny, my career has kind of made a big loop in that I'm trying to teach myself how to shoot and edit myself mm. so I don't have to raise so much money. I don't have to hire crews. Um, Pony Boys, uh, you mentioned, I shot and edited myself. Um, I just have to give a shout out to Katie Chang who helped me figure out Adobe Premiere problems Katie. along the way. Uh, so thank you. Um, <laughs> Because I was just, you know, it was during the pandemic, I was stuck at home and no one around to kind of call in and help mm -hmm, me, but um, mm -hmm. I was able to contact That's Acme what we and get do. some help. <laughs> um, so it's funny, I feel like I'm kind of a kid again, learning all the stuff that I'd kind of known many years ago, but it's all changed. Um, so that's, in a way, that's a good change, is that the means of production have gotten easier mm -hmm. and cheaper and you can make a film with an iPhone. I mean, mm -hmm. really, you can. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Um, but also, I've, I've discovered shorts. Uh, technically, I guess shorts are can films under 40 minutes. I mm -hmm. think that's usually the definition. And um, I never used to do those because they weren't suitable for broadcast. Broadcasters don't like those sort of odd right. lengths. But when I decided, except ACMI, we're fine with. Yeah, yeah good. <laughs> So, uh, but yeah, when I decided I didn't care that much about broadcast, because frankly, um, I shouldn't say this on TV, but you know, so many people get their media now other ways. They're mm -hmm. not watching TV. And so the, the internet doesn't care how long something is. In fact, shorter is better, mm -hmm. generally. And so um, I've really had a good time. Well, I mean, you know, that's an elephant in the room kind of statement. Basically, we're all aware, you know, even us here at ACMI doing very important work on the mm -hmm. community level, things are only headed in one direction in terms of the way that people are, are, are consuming their yeah. media these yeah. days. So you're certainly right about that. And PBS, if any, you know, among, among the, the channels out there, PBS has a very loyal audience and a very consistent one, I would say. Yeah. Even there, though, I imagine that they're feeling the impact of oh, all yeah. of this. Oh, yeah. I think so. They're yeah. really, I mean, all broadcasters are trying to figure out how do we adjust to these new demographics, new technologies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I've enjoyed doing shorts. It's also just so much easier. I mean, to do a 25-minute film versus a 55 or an 85-minute or an film, it mm -hmm. makes a big difference. <laughs> I'll bet it does. I'll bet it does. Um, so uh, just a couple more questions um, about, about life as a filmmaker. Um, one is how... Basically, as you look back on, on the body of work you've produced, you said some of it's commissioned, some of it was done kind of, uh, you know, mindful or in corrobor corroboration, collaboration with PBS mm -hmm. for a particular series or something mm -hmm. like that. How Do you feel always that you've been able to choose your subject or have you kind of, is the reality of being an independent filmmaker or making your life as a filmmaker such that sometimes you just got to do what they ask you to do. Yeah, sometimes you just take something because you need the work and mm -hmm. they're offering a particular subject and you say, oh, that sounds pretty good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're going to pay me to do it, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I'd say it's, it's both. And the ones that have been my ideas or often with a collaborator, um, you know, they, those are the ones that take often two or three years to raise the money. So you have to say yes to something else along the way. And I've done science films uh, for, I did a film for Nova, I've done a, a bunch of things for the Discovery Channel mm -hmm. at one point. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's whatever you can get. 
mm -hmm. when you're in the thick of it, which is why I'm enjoying the luxury now of not having to do that. Right, absolutely. Um, another thing I was wondering about, well, actually, before I get to that, uh, let me just ask you, you've mentioned raising money at various times, and of course that's part of the, mm -hmm. of the sausage making, right? That's, yeah. that's, that's largely hidden from view. Um, mm -hmm. What are the sources that you go to? For yeah, that? for history films, the, really the main source is the National Endowment for the Humanities, which is a government organization funded by Congress established by Congress, I think, in the early 60s. There's a, a National Endowment for the Arts and mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. for the Humanities. And the Humanities one is the main one that funds history films. Mm -hmm. And if you look at American Experience films on PBS, many of them will have NEH funding. Those um, proposals are an absolute bear to do. They take forever. You have to bring together a bunch of scholars. You have, you have to have an advisory panel. You go through many stages, well, several stages usually of writing proposals, mm -hmm. starting for asking for a little bit of money that will then fund you to write the, the bigger proposal. So it can be three years. Mm. And it's, it's not something you, you know, have an Do idea like today <laughs> and yeah. get the money next week. Yeah. But on the other hand, they give you up to $700,000. And, and you can make some some can, movies of it. Usually, for that. yeah. Although often these mm -hmm. days it's more than takes more. So, mm -hmm. but if you get an, an NEH grant and then you go to PBS, it's much easier to. They'll they'll be very happy to see you, and they'll be very happy to give gotcha. you some more money. They won't match it, but they'll give you something. So some tough grant writing is also part yes. of this whole process. It is, and. You know, for something that's less ambitious, um, you know, you're not trying to get an hour-long thing on PBS, there are foundations. There, you can go online and, and research private foundations that support film in, in particular areas, environmental, social justice, um, criminal reform, mm -hmm. uh, all sorts of areas that foundations specialize in that they might be interested in funding a film. So. You know, it's, it's that's worth a po that's a possibility that at least. Oh, gotcha. Um, so my last question about filmmaking, then we'll talk briefly because things are time is flying. Surprise. <laughs> um, we'll talk briefly about Pony Boys to wrap things up. But uh, Arlington, you've been here for all of this time. Yeah. Um, is there anything particularly good, particularly <clears throat> challenging, or does it not really make that much difference for you as your life well, as a filmmaker to be here in Arlington? I mean, there's a nice community of filmmakers in Arlington. I didn't move here because of that. I mean, it came for the usual reasons. It's a great town. But um, over the years, I don't know if they've moved here after I did or they were already here, but yeah. there are quite a few people who work in the general same orbit I do. And actually that film Murder at Harvard I mentioned, the co-producer with me and co-developer of it lives in Arlington, Melissa Banta. She's not a filmmaker, but she... Um, Anyway, it's a long story, but we worked great together. Um, so yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm in a community and I've worked with several of the people in Arlington too. So it's always nice to be surrounded by people of, of like mind right. and, and who, who understand what it is you're trying to do. And then heck, hey, you guys are great. You're very much in the community. Um, Arlington Independent Film Festival, International Film Festival, excuse me. Yeah, well, it's a small festival, but it brings a lot of good films. So there's some good stuff going on here for sure. Right. It is, it, as we know, Arlington's a very vibrant community when it comes to the arts, and uh, that obviously includes film, film, films, filmmaking, filmmakers. Yes. Um, and I think what you just said, I just want to reiterate, it seems so important when you're doing something like filmmaking, which is an intense... Uh, activity that really takes up, uh, you know, just your your whole self in a lot of ways, and may or may not see, you know, the light of day, so to speak, um, or yeah. you don't, you just don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. It's great to have people around you who know how that feels. Yeah, and yeah. You can support you, and you can support in that Absolutely. process. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so speaking about knowing how something feels, Pony Boys, which uh, mm -hmm. again is the is the way I got you uh, at, uh, up to this desk. Um, it, you were saying before we went on air that it often will, it, it's a short film that will often be part of a series of shorts at a festival and usually be the last one. 
Um, <laughs> and I think I know why, but I'd like to ask <laughs> you to tell us. Well, it's a great story. Pony Boys is about two boys, nine and 11 years old, brothers who in the summer of 1967 uh, took their pet Shetland pony and a pony cart from Needham, Massachusetts to Montreal, 325 miles or so, alone, just the two of them, because they wanted to go to Expo 67, the World's Fair in Montreal. And their mother not just allowed them, she enabled the trip. She got, made them prepare, she trained them, she showed them how to, the, the routes and how to read the map and how to take care of the pony, and, and then she sent them off. And they made it. It took them 27 days. And it's, it's a hilarious story in a way. I mean, obviously, it could have gone horribly wrong, but it didn't. Right, it didn't. Um, they had a wonderful time. They tell the story in a very genuine and funny and sort of self-deprecating way. Um, so it's, it's turned out to be a charming film. People mm -hmm. are just find it delightful. It's, it's a great story. It's nostalgic. It's, it brings up serious questions about parenting and how much is too much freedom and this and that, but it doesn't dwell on that. Mm -hmm. It's really just the two guys recalling their summer 55 years ago and how much fun they had. Uh, so, it, yeah, it's been a lot of fun to make. It's a lot of fun to show people. People just love it. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't call it a comedy. No, but, I have but to it, say. Is a feel, like, it, it is fun to watch. It's fun to watch. Uh, I have to say, yeah. it absolutely, it's, the time just flies. Yeah. And most documentaries I've made, you know, there may be a few light moments mm -hmm. in them, right. a few laughs here and there, but you know, yeah. this is the first one I made that's just kind of laughing all the way through. So and like you said, it's fun. kind of like a hit, right? Yeah, it's, been, yeah, it's, it's doing been really well, and festivals. Been... It was in the New York, it still is on the New York Times website. Uh, it's a New York Times op doc, so if you Google uh, and NewYorkTimes.com slash op dash docs, mm -hmm. you'll find it. Just look for Pony Boys, and yeah, you can, everyone can see it now. Yeah, That's no, great. I think it's 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 it really is. It's it's kind of heartwarming. But you're right; it also evokes. It's interesting because we've been talking about history, and you were saying you doing stuff that's a little bit more contemporary and this obviously is this is from the recent 20th you know, relatively recent 20th century uh you know 50 years not 150 or more um but nonetheless it is kind of a historical artifact in a sense because it does evoke this time when such a thing was ludicrous but possible <laughs> they did it right and yeah. and again it's hard to imagine in our current world just th this all coming together in a yeah. way that would make it possible. Yeah, it is hard to imagine. Although I find myself wondering, is it hard to imagine because we're, we've become more frightened in mm -hmm. general? Mm -hmm. I don't know that there was less violence back then. I mean, mm -hmm. the summer of 1967 was pretty fraught, although right. not in Vermont and New Hampshire right. where these kids right. were. And they had no cell phones, of course, no way of staying in touch. Nowadays, you know, to have cell phones. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. Hard to know whether it would be harder or easier this time around. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, anyway, it's just, it's great that you've captured the this, this story uh, as it is. So, very last question, and then we'll let you go. Um, what are you working on? <laughs> Good question. Um, well, my stock answer to that right now, because I get asked a lot when we show Pony Boys, is that I say I'm quizzing my neighbors. <laughs> trying to find another good story because this story how was that happened. from a neighbor. I, I, it all came about through a neighborhood barbecue. And, um, but so far, none of the neighbors have come through <laughs> with as good a story. Um, I'm, I'm beginning to write a grant to the National Endowment for the Humanities, even though I swore I'd never do it again, about the a film about the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, who were the American volunteers who fought in the Spanish Civil mm. War. And yeah, it's very reminiscent of American veterans who are going to fight in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. um, these were not usually veterans, but they were young Americans who felt the need to go fight fascism in the mid-30s. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them died. Absolutely. And a lot I, of them were wounded. Uh, yeah, tough, tough stories there. A lot of idealism mm -hmm. and, a, and a lot of you know, death and destruction and brutality, unfortunately, yeah, yeah. as well. And, and the war was lost by mm -hmm. them. The bad guys won. The bad guys did win. These these young people felt the need to go. So All right. That's well, a good story. We do wish you good luck with that. Uh, you Thank may be you back James. talking about that yeah. at some point here. Yeah. I hope so. Great. Well, uh, thanks. I it's would been a be real pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Me too. Thanks, James.
I have been speaking with Eric Stange. He is a filmmaker that has been based here in Arlington for a long time, made, as he said, at least 20 films. I'm sure he probably underestimated it. Um, and uh, it's been our pleasure. We hope that you've enjoyed it as well. We thank Eric for his time. We thank you thank for you. yours. And I'm James Milan. This is Talk of the Town. We'll see you next time.